This is Al Black with Tim Conroy, Chewing the Gristle, a poetry chat. Our guest today is Gary Grossman. Gary Grossman has been a poet since high school, a stone carver since 2002, and a singer-songwriter since 2011. In his day job, he is a professor of animal ecology at the University of Georgia, where he uses his songwriting to help teach his students about animal ecology. From 2009 to 2019, he wrote the advice column, Ask Dr. Trout, for the American Angler Magazine. He has written over 135 academic papers and has testified before Congress about salmon ecology. In his free time, he likes to fish, jog, garden, hunt, and has written a cookbook of venison recipes called A Bone to Pick, Everyone's Guide to Gourmet Venison Cookery. His wife, teaches nutrition at the University of Georgia where their two daughters are pursuing advanced degrees in veterinary and neurosciences. You can find him at www.garygrossman.net. Welcome, Gary. We're happy to have you. Well, thanks, Al and Tim. And, and uh, just to make a minor correction for my older daughter's ego, she actually is a veterinarian. So she has finished all her, all her schooling, and, and she actually is doing advanced training in veterinary surgery. So uh, uh, both my wife and I are proud of, of, of both our kids. So uh, again, it's a real honor to be here, and uh, I am at your service, so uh, ask away. All right. Were you always interested in poetry as a student, or... Or has it deepened as you got older? And tell us about your other creative endeavors and how they may actually impact your poetry writing or your poetry writing impact uh, your, your stone carving and your music. Okay, well, that's about a 10-minute question there. So let me, let me get started here. Uh, I have always liked to write. Uh, and in fact, we'll, we'll see if uh, you can tell me if this shows up. Uh, this is, oh, sorry, I got it the wrong side. This is a poem uh, I wrote when I was 15 in a creative writing class. I know Al is old enough to know what that blue ink is from. Do you what, tell us what that's from, Al? The blue ink? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to hazard the guess. I'll probably okay. be wrong. Okay, sorry, I shouldn't be, uh, I shouldn't please, be holding, right? holding the exam. It's mimeograph. I know oh, you're yes. old enough to know what, you know, pre-Xerox. So okay. uh, that tells you how old uh, uh, it, it is. So Does it um, still have that smell of mini mimeograph, like when you get a fresh quiz? <laughs> yeah, you know, people used to get high off that, but we'll leave that topic aside. Um, I don't, you mentioned that I like to do a lot of things and, and uh, maybe it's just a constructive way of, uh, of, of focusing undiagnosed ADHD. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure, but I seem to pick up a new hobby about every 10 years uh, and that gets added to the repertoire uh, for better or worse. Um, so back to the original question, which is kind of tracing the arc of my, of my writing. Uh, I, I, of course, was a, a science major in undergraduate and in graduate school, and practice in creative writing helped me in those ventures in, in kind of the logistics of writing, right? Like, you know, writing every day, uh, learning how to edit. Uh, learning how to take criticism without crying. Um, so working as a high school student in, in the creative venue, that helped me in, in my scientific writing as well. And uh, I think in some respects, uh, science and poetry both have the same goal, and that is to take uh, events in the real world 
and see them in a way that no one else has, has seen them and, and then be able to communicate that uniqueness. So uh, when I think of a scientific paper it, that's really good, it, it has exactly the same goal as a, as a poem, and that is to leave the reader going, wow, that, you know, that was well expressed, and I get it. Uh, I guess that's the, you know, that's the most important thing, that the reader get it, uh, even though as individuals we all bring something a little different to, to, to getting it. Um, so throughout my life, I'm 66, so about to collect full social security while it still exists, thank you very much. Uh, I, I mean, I have written poetry sporadically and, uh, you know, it's kind of like I'll be jogging and something will, I'll see something and it will, uh, it will bring a, a poetic theme or a poetic image to mind and, you know, I don't stop jogging, but the first thing I do when I get home is write down, go to the computer and, and write down what I've seen. And, and I, I actually do that all the time. Uh, and you mentioned maybe having some questions about advice for young poets. Uh, and, and one of the best pieces of advice I could give is always keep a pen and a little pad with you. Uh, and just any time you're seized by one of these creative moments, start writing it down and, and keep it in a file somewhere. And, and then you, when you feel the urge to write a poem or a creative nonfiction piece, just, just take those things out and, and weave them together. Because I, I think inspiration for most of us doesn't come in complete format, right? It comes in little little pieces and stanzas and an image that, that we then can, can use to weave a complete whole. Hey, that, Gary, before I ask uh, this question, you know, talking about fishing kind of got me curious. Have you, have you read um, this book? Uh, I just started it. Uh, it's upside down. Yeah. yeah. And it's such a well, great Well, I, I read it when it was right side up, but that yeah, oh, way it might be a oh, little Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Well, you know, so, these, these yes, I, I read it I read it many years ago and I and I do like uh, in particular there's a whole genre of fly fishing, uh, creative nonfiction and memoir. Uh, John Garrick and Robert Traver back from the forties and Ernest Hemingway's uh, Big Two-Hearted River. Uh, so yeah, I do. I do read fishing literature, and I and I like that. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because he uh, Hershey brings in uh, poetry into this sort of blended genre, sort of non-traditional um, uh, novel that he writes. He crafts, uh, and I I just love it. You know, I. I never read it, you know, uh, and somebody just recently uh, uh, referenced it to me, and I said, well, I, I should read that. It sounds wonderful. Uh, and so anyway, it's, uh, um, it's something I've enjoyed, and I thought maybe in terms of your writing, and, and have you done any, any blended genre type writing? Uh, I'm trying to think. I like to think that all my writing is poetry, whether it's scientific or creative nonfiction. Uh, I, I haven't, really, my writing has, uh, has focused in, uh, on scientific things, right? Because as a professor, we're always writing papers and writing grant proposals, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, within the constraints of those types of writing formats, um, I have tried to, to be as poetic as possible and, uh, you know, to make connections. And uh, it has been said, I can't remember who said it, but that the scientific paper is, is the biggest lie and the, you know, the driest piece of writing you could possibly read. And throughout my career, I, I, you know, I really have tried to to fight that and make it so that, uh, so that my papers are are quite readable and maybe even enjoyable if my ego will let me go that far. So you know, go, going back to a question about poetry, for, what makes, uh, what are the elements that make a good poem? Or if you want to 
broaden it out to what makes it good a, a good piece of writing, that's fine too. Yeah. Well, I think since we're we uh, we're focusing on poetry here, uh, the thing that that uh, that I admire the most about a good poem uh, is its transformative property. So taking something uh, that that you wouldn't think is related to something else and showing that in fact it is. Um, and I could read a poem to illustrate that if you... Uh, let's, let's do that. That's, okay. That's great. Uh, lately I, I've been writing COVID poems, so uh, I'd like to read a few of those. Um, all right, so this is a poem called Moderation. One. Flew home from Israel in week two of the plague, 14 day quarantine, and my Zeta's haint rasps, idle hands, devil's friend. So I'm painting our mange blotched 1940s Cape Cod, our peeling white heart haven. Kibbutz Mizra, plague day four. I flail against the government's web, canceled flights and shuttered stores in the Holy Land where the air rustles nervously despite greening hills and there is no moderation. The new order tells my hotel to shed me like winter fur in April, but kindness prevails and I remain fed even. Anxiety forecast now, cloudy with occasional sun. Plague safety and painting are best taken in moderation. Six feet apart outside, but talk. 16 feet up the ladder, but please, no farther. Mental health jogging, but personal distance from step one. Rules too harsh, you rush. Overload the brush. Paint drips and spatters on finished spaces, and the virus persists. Painting is mediation. Smooth, silky brushes caressing the clabbered. Our house skin now sporting layers of ivory. Life and painting, both 90% preparation. Wash, scrape, prime, mask, wipe, scrub. Listen, think, act. Zeta said, anything worth doing is worth doing right. But I'll always have spots to touch up. Man, that's wonderful. I, I love how that's so grounded with imagery all the way through. Thank you. So, I mean, that's an example of I mean, who would have thought painting and what we're doing during COVID-19 is have any similarities? So that, that to me, the transformative nature of, of poetry, um, seeing things in a, it, just seeing things in a new light, using descriptors, which, you know, no one else thought of, but are clearly, you know, your heart tells you are true. Uh, that's a really good poem. And, and, and I'll also say if you, you know, if you couldn't tell from, from that poem, um, I like very simple words. And I think that that's the talent of a great poet. It, well, that sounds like I'm bragging. I don't mean to say it that way, but uh, I, a talented poet is someone who, takes, who can take everyday language and combine it in a way so that you just go, wow, I, I just, I never thought somebody could do that. There is power in ordinary language. There is so much power uh, that you can express. You know, as in an arc of a writing career, um, as you work through not being so good and working through mediocrity, um, any advice... You're speaking about yourself, of course. It, yes, yes. Any advice to, uh, about uh, persistence and, and how you deal with rejection? Uh Sure. Uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, all those grad students think they have it now. Uh, they have it bad now. It, it, times were horrible. They sent, there were no academic jobs or, or anything. And uh, we just kind of went, we got a PhD because it was something we wanted to do and we couldn't believe we actually got paid to do it. And, and uh, uh, so there was a very famous scientist whose office was down the hall from my office as a graduate student. And the thing that I remember obviously till this day is he had taped over his desk, B 
Babe Ruth struck out 1,321 times. And so, you know, that's the sage advice. You, 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 you get up, you dust yourself off, and you get right back in the batter's box. That's, that's great. Uh, Brother Al. Yeah. <clears throat> can, I, can I say one last, I'd like to oh, yeah. add one last thing, and that is, uh, you know, especially when you're a young scientist, you're easy at getting papers published in good scientific journals. Uh, and, and again, there are a lot of analogies between being a research scientist and writing papers and, and writing poetry. But we used to complain about the reviewers of our papers. Uh, and, it, and I started writing poetry and it was like, you have no idea how brutal the world can be. Uh, just submitting th things, you know, to, to review after review, getting no feedback. Uh, or I'll, I'll never forget that uh, I sent, when I, when I started writing poetry again as an adult, I sent some poems to a well-known review. And the editor who handled it, a well-known poet, said simply, uh, there's nothing in this that resembles poetry. And, and so we've all been kicked in the face, uh, you know, regardless of how experienced or inexperienced we are. Uh, and you just have to have faith in your work and, and your work has to be meaningful to you. I mean, if you're not, if you're doing it for somebody else, then that's not the right reason to do it because you'll never be able to uh, have the fortitude that it takes to be successful at, at, at something like poetry. You know, you have to have this need within your heart to express yourself, and uh, and you have to kind of rely on that and and say, what I'm doing is good. I like what I'm doing. Wonderful. <clears throat> so, in poetry, who are your favorites and who are you reading now? And as you write. When do you know the poem's finished? When do you, or do you revise that much? Yeah, so let's take the last question first, right? Come on, guys, a poem is never finished. We're always tinkering five years down the line, changing a word here, shifting a, you know, a comma, or so. Uh, I'm always tinkering with, with my poems. Uh, at, who are my favorite poets? Uh, you know, I'll be iconoclastic again, and I'll say I don't, I have favorite poems, but I don't have favorite poets. And maybe it's my undiagnosed ADHD or, or whatever, but, you know, I'll read a couple of poems from someone, and, and I'll go, wow, this is great. I need to go out and buy their book. And I'll go buy the book. And, you know, maybe 15% of the poems, I'll just go, man, this is, you know, as my people would say Drek. I mean, uh, so, I, you know, everybody's, even the most famous people, just from my point of view, I won't claim to be the expert reviewer on poetry, um, but most people, most well-known poets, talented poets, um, seem to, to have some poems that are, uh, that don't move me the way some others do. Um, so who do I like? Well, I, uh, I, I love Merwin. Uh, uh, I mean, I love William Carlos Williams. I mean, the Red Wagon poem to me is one of the, it should be in every anthology of, of poetry that's ever written. Uh, and the Plum poem. We actually read that at, at my, my wedding uh, 40 years ago. That was one of, one of the groomsmen read that. Everybody had to read, read something. So, uh, who do I, I like Louise Gluck, I like uh, uh, Mary Oliver, uh, Rita Dove. Uh, I, I mean, there's hardly a poet that I don't like, actually, or that I don't like a poem of, uh, or five poems of. So um, all, of, all of the poets that I really like and the poems that, of theirs that I like uh, all have that transcendent quality. So. You know, I just want to, I know also you're a singer-songwriter and, and stone carver. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, 
a little bit more about how sing, singing songwriting sort of um, influences poetry and vice versa. Right. So, uh, so that's that's it's an interesting contrast because I just write free verse and poetry, uh, but but my songs are all in verse. Um, so how, how are they related? I, I think that meter is much more important in song than it is in poetry, but of course they help one another. I mean, even, even after writing five songs or whatever, then going back to trying to write a poem, uh, that the importance of meter is still with me. So even though there's no rhyme, uh, like when I frequently write or frequently when I write a poem, uh, and this happened only after writing songs, is that uh, as I'm starting, I'll write down next to the line the syllable count. And so I'll try to keep my syllable count fairly consistent, uh, so consistent meter, uh, unless I want to change it. You know, I want to I want to have kind of a break there. So um, that's. Uh, that's the most immediate thing that comes into mind as a, as a difference. Um, I think imagery, again, is, is really important in lyrics. And, and you know, I would say uh, if you took out the repeated uh, choruses and things that, that my songs, the lyrics of my songs would stand as, as poems as well. So, I, you know, the other, the poetry influencing the songwriting is again, trying to write things that are transformative, to use uh, uh, images that, that, that click in a, in a new way, but also hit you in the heart. Hey, Gary, can you tell the listeners which uh, instrument you play? I play the ukulele, which Al, in our pre-interview uh, uh, discussion, uh, insulted repeatedly. I just want the audience to know that. <laughs> you were going to tell us a story about the ukulele in terms of, of how it was crafted, how it was made. Right. So, um, so I, I like old things a lot. Like I write with old fountain pens and, and uh, uh, most of the ukuleles I have, Martin ukuleles that are around 100 years old, to tell you the truth. Um, but I had a not very pleasant upbringing as a child. And so, you know, my joke is that uh, there were no heirlooms in our, in our family, you know, aside from guilt and uh, poverty and, uh, but also a level of inquisitiveness and a willingness to work hard. So it wasn't, it wasn't all bad, but uh, the point is uh, for my family, uh, liking history and things. I want, I needed to create my own heirlooms. So, um, so this is a ukulele that, that was made for me by uh, Scott Baxendale, uh, Luthier to the Stars. Uh, and it's made out of cherry wood that came from a tree that uh, grew for many, many years in our, in our backyard and fortunately started to die. And so we uh, we had it cut down and the wood aged and I had hope chests made for both my girls uh, and a couple ukuleles. So uh, because of my family situation, the heirlooms that I'm going to pass on are ones that I create myself. That's wonderful. Uh, and Gary, I want you to know that my wife is a ukulele player. So I guess you you and Al don't have dinner together much, huh? Nobody has dinner with Al. <laughs> Oh, I'm crushed. I'm crushed. <laughs> so, so um, Gary, you want to read another? Um, sure, yeah. I'll I'll read. Uh, I'd love to read more more poems, and I have these kind of organized. Um, so I in, until this COVID thing happened, and that the poem moderation. Uh, actually is, is based on my true experience. So I actually was in Israel in mid-March setting up a collaboration when all the COVID crap uh, happened. And I did, in fact, paint my house uh, during, during COVID. But uh, the, I guess 
being alone, at, not alone, but being at home a lot, uh, got me back into a, a poetry uh, mode. So, uh, so this is another COVID poem, as I probably don't need to tell you, but it is entitled Hand Sanitizer. Years, no weeks ago, I had no use for hand disinfectant. No peering at labels alcohol content like I do for bottles of Cabernet and mid-level ethanol. Or wipes. I mean, who carried those around? Cleansing store entrance knobs and just purchased ho-hos. Should I buy a clear bottle or a tinted bottle? Should I wear a mask? May I touch my face or my wife's? my daughter's rosy cheeks, so many questions. I love that. So I, I guess I would also say, and that poem is a good example, that the poem moderation is longer than, than my poems usually. And so uh, again, you asked me uh, in, our, in our little pregame warm up uh, to, to comment on, on advice. And, uh, or, or maybe also just to describe my poetry in a way that would be useful for other writers. Uh, and, and so that poem is an example of, of, of what I like and try to do in my poetry. And, you know, the analogy is, is like uh, major surgery, okay? Uh, you, you get in there quickly, you do what you have to do, and then you get out. Uh, so, so I think that a problem many poets have is, uh, is their, their poems just go on and on and on, and uh, longer is not better. <laughs> uh, as, as a Japanese show in haiku, right, uh, there is a tremendous intellect and talent uh, in, in saying something with just 12 syllables. Uh, so... Okay, so here's, here's another longer poem. Uh, this is called Bud Break, uh, and it's, it's for a friend of mine's family. Uh, okay, so one, March 22nd and life pivots. Mother son climbs the rungs of her annual ladder, solstice to equinox. In the Georgia woods, a lone wren calls. Ground fog rises through trunks painted in grays and corrugated browns, the aged palettes of Bruegel, elder and younger. But small greens call spring's name, that boisterous child of each solar cycle, trees leafing out fast as snap fingers. Mint, moss, and shamrock, limbs putting on lime cloaks ripening to olive like my skin aged from ivory to speckled tan. Two, leaf fall is months away and that final winter, three score and 10 yet not for all. Wyatt, 21, who dove again and again into a chemical sea. Arms extended, we reached through funneled currents and wrestled the 10 armed the ten-armed reaper, but the boys surface no more. Kids grow old, or kid, I'm sorry, kids grow up, old friendships crack like slightly broken branches. Reunions of convenience, neighborhood shops, and the local pool. At the memorial, she broke when I held her. Salty rain on my shoulder, and a burden like Lot's wife. Surely I could have done more. But the buds will break again next year, and the next woods bursting green, late March, or perhaps early April. Wonderful. <clears throat> so, you know, not just for poets, but for writing in general, and especially as a professor, you talk to your students, how do you how do you tell them to let their interests and their emotions inform their writing? Right. Well, uh, you know, when, if we're talking about science, the last thing I kind of want is their emotions to infuse their writing. Uh, and and uh, 
uh, Al, Al again is old enough to remember the show Dragnet and uh, Joe Fridays, whose watchwords were just the facts, just the facts. And so in, in scientific writing, the problem that most people have uh, is straying from the facts. Is it, it's, The writing is turgid rather than terse. So, um, so I, 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 I do want them to funnel their creative energies into uh, choosing projects that uh, show something important and new. Uh, but in terms of writing alone, um, you know, the, the biggest problem is kind of reining them in and keeping them on track and, and uh, in some cases just basic English, not to diss high schools and undergraduate institutions, but the students nowadays do, you know, uh, their view of writing is typing LOL in a, in a uh, smartphone. And, uh, and they're, they're really, they really come to the university, many, many of them, um, poorly trained in, in how to do nonfiction writing. Now, I, I, I think I saw, you know, I was, I was looking um, on your website, and I think I saw something that caught my interest about your teaching uh, requirements, um, requiring the students to do, to write a karaoke, or do a karaoke song at the end. Um, and I just loved that. I thought it was great. Yeah. So, you know, I suppose most of us, when we, after we've been in this business for 30 years or so, uh, and our, reputa our scientific reputations are either made or they're not made, and they're not going to be made. Uh, you start thinking about giving back. What can, you, what can you give back to your field? And there are a variety of ways to do that. Um, about 10 years ago, I started teaching a non-majors class that fulfilled uh, science requirements for non-science majors. Uh, natural history of Georgia, and and uh, I like to uh, derisively call it ecology for art majors. Uh, but of course, when you're dealing with students who are who don't have a basic interest in the subject, you really have to try and and think of innovative ways to keep them engaged. So, uh, so I I began uh, writing songs which I use during lecture. So. Uh, when I lecture about the biology of the cardinal, I, I play my little music video uh, on the, entitled Redbird. And, uh, and the, the goal there is, is that if they learn the lyrics to the song, they actually need all they need to know information-wise to do well on the exam. And, uh, and so, so I was talking, so the use of... Uh, of, of, of multimedia uh, uh, in, in, in pedagogy is, is important, especially in this, you know, in the age group of undergraduates that are uh, 18 to 22 because they listen to music all the time. So imparting science, uh, knowledge about science via music is, you know, that's, uh, I mean, you got them right there, okay? So I was talking to a friend in, who's an education professor, and, and he said, well, you know, that's all well and good, but the big thing in education now is active learning versus passive learning. So what you're giving them in these songs is multimodal, and that's good, but it's still passive. They sit and listen and memorize, and you, uh, uh, you, know, and, and you do all the work. So how can you... Uh, how can you make this an active learning uh, exercise where the students uh, do this all themselves? And, you know, egotistically, I, I said, oh, no student could possibly do this, you know. And, and then I started thinking, because the idea was such a good idea, and I thought, well, uh, we can do a karaoke exercise where uh, they can take whatever music they want off the, off the web, uh, and uh, they can take whatever, whatever video or visuals they want off the web, but they need to write a song, uh, and they need to sing, rap, or speak the song, uh, and, and make a karaoke video. And 
And so the idea is, of course, tremendous learning, and, and it can be on a species, it can be on a habitat, uh, or it could be on an ecological theory or principle. Um, and, and so obviously the, the whole idea of active learning is by investigating all this kind of stuff on your own, uh, that's, that's how you learn it, right? That's the best way to learn it. Um, so I've been doing that exercise for, I guess, seven or eight years. Uh, published a page a paper in a in a major science ed journal uh, on it. I, I uh, interviewed students and had questionnaires, and and pretty uniformly the the students liked it. Uh, although interestingly, I taught a graduate class last fall in which a number of the students really really pushed back, uh, and that was quite disappointing to see. And it was. It was a group that, uh, you know, they were not interested in broadening their horizons. Even though I said to them, look, you're 21st century biologists. You're going to have to learn how to, how to make videos and things in whatever job you have. But it was like, you know, well, I won't go on dissing students. But it was, let, me, let me say that I'm not sure it's universally liked at this point. So. Oh, well. Um. <clears throat> Tim and I are very excited that you came on, and we, we're very appreciative of you coming on and, and <clears throat> doing this interview with, with Chewing the Gristle. And uh, 66 is young, I'm, I'm telling you. Uh, uh, it's not that old uh, anymore. So uh, you have a, a great career still ahead of you. And we're excited what, what we've seen that you've done already. And we want to encourage folks who want to uh, learn more about uh, Gary Grossman to go to Gary, G-A-R-Y, Grossman, G-R-O-S-S-M-A-N, dot net, and uh, explore what Gary Grossman is doing. We want to thank you, Gary. Well, thanks so much, Al. And, and you need to put a www in front of that web address. So it's www.garygrossman.net. And web addresses are case sensitive. So that's all lowercase. Uh, of course, you can Google Gary D. Grossman and you'll, you'll probably get there. Hey, uh, Gary, as, as, as we end, could you just Pick us out. Just pick up that ukulele and, and play us out. Okay. Uh, first, let me, let me say that uh, I want to encourage everybody to write. Uh, don't put that pen down. Don't put that keyboard away. Keep at it, and eventually you're going to come up with something that when you read it, you go, this is me. This is something I always wanted to, to do and be. Uh, and, and don't ever give up. And I, I've actually stopped submitting my work to reviews. I have, a, uh, I have a site on Medium, and I just put my poems up on Medium. And, uh, uh, you know, with the web, I mean, if you're, I suppose, a starting out poet and you want to be a professional poet, uh, you do need to publish in good journals. But for, for most of us, uh, it's just important to get our work out there so that, that people can see it. So, so think about that when you're writing. And uh, so this is, this is a song uh, called Heat Lightning. She's just a flash of heat lightning Lighten up that Georgia sky Her ears trace my burning breast The slightest breeze and off she flies When I came back from overseas For tranquil trails and scented pines She told me that she'd wait for me steal away when I arrived. Well, I've had too much heat lightning of 
promises that crack like lies of distances that never close my heart needs rain but clouds pass by she's just a flash of heat lightning lighting up that georgia sky her heated touch my halted breath a puff of wind and off she flies Well, I came up in Clarksville old With mountains clad in greenery And streams are running deep and clear The hollers full of hickories My daddy flashed as he lightning Pink black moods and rain and blows our house was full of drink and dread And love was never to be shown So many kinds of heat lightning One fades away, the other nears Her parting words, his lifted fists He lightning brings us to our fears and so this story has no end Sins of fathers to their sons Mothers warn your daughters too Be lightning shall not pass to you Be wary of that heat lightning To promise love and then deny I forgot my ending of my song Be wary of that heat lightning To promise love and then deny no shattered hearts, no yearning, please. Need lightning to pass over me. Need lightning, please don't strike at me. I loved it, man. That was great. That was wonderful. Thank you. Well, thanks, guys. It's been such an honor to have this experience and get to know you all better.